Hey everybody, welcome back to Off The Grid Tiny House. We're on day 21 of our 50 day challenge. If you wanna learn more about that, check out our intro video. In our last episode, we installed our bottom of the wall flashing and our weather resistant barrier. And in this episode, we're installing our doors and windows. I have a really hard time wrapping my head around the lack of knowledge that most home buyers, realtors, architects, and designers have about windows. Just try asking them about U-Value or SHGC and see what kind of answer you get. I want to take some time today to teach you a little about windows because I think this stuff is really important when it comes to designing your tiny house. First, a window is basically a hole in your house. It's usually the least insulated part of the house, the most common area for water damage to occur, and a prime suspect when it comes to drafts and air infiltration. We talked about control layers in several past episodes and windows are the mortal enemies of control layers. Now don't get me wrong, I think windows are awesome and I designed the tiny house to have four of them and another in the front door. However, I chose the locations for these windows to best allow natural light into the house and provide a pleasant view, not to enhance curb appeal. Now, if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, like me, your most Southern facing windows will receive the most light and your Northern facing windows will receive the least. Your East facing windows will receive the most glare in the morning when the sun is low in the sky and your West facing windows will receive the most glare in the evenings. This is all due to the earth spinning on its axis in relation to the sun and definitely something you want to keep in mind when you're designing your tiny house or when you're parking your tiny house on your lot and deciding which way to orient it. U value is the reciprocal of R value. When talking about insulation, we wanted a higher R value, but with windows, we want a lower U value. Kind of confusing. Many people know that windows can be single, double, or triple pane, but did you also know that there are different coatings that can be applied to the glass to either increase or decrease the U value? This is definitely something you want to pay attention to. SHGC stands for solar heat gain coefficient and is a measure of how much solar heat will pass through the window. This is different from VT or visible transmittance, which is a measure of how much light will pass through the window. Again, different coatings on the glass will allow for higher or lower SHGC values. In a colder climate, you want windows with a higher SHGC and in warmer climates, you will want a lower SHGC. Overhangs are also very important the sun will get higher in the sky throughout the day, so during the hottest part of the day, the sun is usually at its highest point in the sky. Adding overhangs over your windows will shade the window during this time and limit the amount of sun that enters the home so it's more consistent throughout the day. Consistently maintained foliage can also be used to shade a window from receiving too much midday sun or limiting evening glare. All of this was less of a concern for me in coastal California because it's usually cool and sunny all day throughout the year. However, I did limit the amount of window area to reduce heating costs at night. Before we begin today, I also want to make sure you understand the terminology we'll be using as we install the windows and doors. The head of the window is the top, the jams are the sides, and the sill is the bottom. We will be using these terms quite often throughout the episode. Let's take a quick overview of what we hope to accomplish today. We will install the four windows following the manufacturer's instructions precisely. Windows are a primary source of water damage, so they have to be installed carefully. We will then install the two doors. So our first step in doing the windows is gonna to be to cut out the Tyvek. And we're gonna do like an eye cut. So we're gonna start in the middle, make a cut right down. And then we're gonna cut the top and the bottom. Helps to have a really good, sharp, new knife. We then make a diagonal cut at each of the top corners and fold up about four to six inches of WRB. We wrap the two sides around the window jams, staple them down on the inside, and cut off the excess. Next, we nail down some scrap OSB to the back edge of the windowsill. This is called a back dam and will ensure that any water that finds its way behind the window will be directed under the window and to the outside. The third step is to install some flexible flashing to the windowsill. This is some very sticky, very flexible, and very expensive tape that ensures the windowsill is completely protected from water damage. This tape is pretty incredible the way it can go around corners and still lay flat. Next, we lift the window into the opening, but don't screw it in yet. We just want to make sure it will fit before we apply caulk to the flanges. 
we took off any extra wood, tape, or tags that came at the window and applied a thick bead of caulk around the top and side nailing flanges. We don't apply caulk to the bottom so that if any water is directed under the window by the back dam and flexible flashing, it can exit here and run down the WRB. We lift the window and set it into place once more, but this time we stick just a couple screws in. Using a level and shims, we fine tune it on the inside until it is level and plumb. So you can see how the window comes with these slotted flanges. And so that's, that means we can just get some fine tuning. So that's what we did on the inside. We used the shims, we got it really nice, square, level, plumb. And now that we're, we're sure that it's level, we can go back in and finish off all of these screws. These screws are covered first on the sides of the window by some flashing tape, and then on the top. Next, we fold the WRB back down over the window flange and tape it down with some Tyvek tape. The last step is to go back on the inside, cut off the shims, and spray foam any cracks between the window and the framing. We use window spray foam because it doesn't expand like the spray foam we used in the past. If you're enjoying these videos and learning a lot, there's many ways to help us out. You can like the video, subscribe to our channel, or visit our Patreon page and for a small monthly donation, get access to things like behind the scenes videos and Q and A's. If you're building your own tiny house, you can use the links in the description below to order your tools and materials. We really appreciate all those who've helped us out and make this channel possible. The door installation begins much the same as the window installation. We make the same I-shaped cut in the WRB and the same fold at the top. But when we wrap the WRB around the sides of the door jams, we will only staple the top of the WRB. The next step is to install a sill pan. The sill pan works in much the same way as the flexible flashing, but it's a little more heavy duty because the bottom of the doors will receive a lot more weight and movement than the bottom of the windows. It also has the potential to receive a lot more water because the doors will be opened much more often than the windows. Insulation of a sill pan is proven to reduce chances of water damage underneath doors. The manufacturer's instructions for the sill pan I purchased call for it to be sized one quarter inch smaller than the door opening and to be attached to the subfloor with three beads of caulk. With the sill pan installed, we can now fold the bottom of the WRB over the sides of the sill pan and around the jams and staple it down. We next remove any visible stickers or door plugs or protective shipping caps from the door, apply three beads of caulk to the top of the sill pan, and hoist the door up and onto the sill pan. To shim the door, we first shim the bottom on both sides to keep the door tight to the center of the opening. We next screw some three inch screws through the jam and the shims and into the wood frame on both sides of the door. When we first set the door in, I noticed it was leaning just a little bit this way. And so what I want to do is shim the bottom first and I wanted to shim mostly on the right side. You can see down there because that's the side that, that we need the movement on to straighten it out. Obviously this is exaggerated, but uh, we want to just move that bottom in. So that's why you see no shim over here. And you see the shim over there. So that's the first thing we're going to shim. Now we're going to move up our hinge side and we're just going to make sure we're nice and plumb the whole way up. So one thing with the, with the shims is you can always move it this way, but you can't move it this way without screws. So if we want to move it this way, we have to put the shims in and then leave a gap and use the screw and the screw will suck it in. So that's what we're going to do. Next, we shim the hinge side to ensure the door jam is plumb. At this point, we can swing open the door a bit to make sure we have a smooth, unobstructed swing. So once you have a couple screws in and you're looking pretty good, some doors will come with extra long screws that match uh, the hinge screws. This door is a little cheaper, it didn't. But you want to remove at least one screw from each two hinge plates. Make sure you have shims behind it so it doesn't get sucked in. And then uh, replace that screw with a nice long screw that's going to go into your framing. So you see the gap down there and then it comes in. So we're going to use shims and screws to position this so that the gap we see down there is consistent all the way from top to bottom. So right now you see there's a nice gap at the bottom and then there's nothing. And that's because this is not screwed in. It's just kind of flapping there. So 
If we put a shim and a screw in, it's going to lock it in. The further we stick in the shim and then we screw it, the more it's going to stay out. If we pull the shim in and screw it, pull the shim out and screw it, then it's going to suck the door frame in. And so we can use the shims and screws to get a nice consistent reveal top to bottom. So there's the same gap right here as there is down at the bottom. It's very important to put some extra shims and screws near the door lock locations so they stay put permanently. Once the door is screwed down, we flash the door very much like we did with the windows, starting with the jams, ending with the head, and folding the WRB back down over the head. We also apply spray foam on the inside between the door jams and the framing. Every episode I want to take some time to talk about what went wrong, what I would have liked to do better. And with this episode, you know, windows, doors, you really got to have some friends help you lift them into place. It's not something you can do yourself. So luckily I have some great neighbors here and uh, I had one of them over to help. And sometimes when people come to help out, I can feel a little rushed because their time is valuable. And sometimes I don't quite have everything ready the way I'd like to. So, you know, doors always come with a bunch of junk attached to them, little paper and plastic that you ought to peel off. And I thought I had prepped everything. I thought I was ready to go. But once we set the door into place, I realized that there were two plastic pieces on the very bottom that I hadn't noticed and I hadn't taken off. So. I was leveling the door and I was like, why is this so crooked? This is weird. And then I looked at the bottom and I realized that I hadn't taken those plastic pieces off. So we had to take the door out, remove the plastic pieces and put it back in. So um, definitely took some extra time and just another area where uh, detail and, and taking your time, making sure that you double check things can really help out. In our next episode, we'll be installing the rough plumbing for the tiny house. Now we have finished plumbing that you can see after the house is finished. And then we have rough plumbing, which is the part that's hidden behind the walls that you don't see when the house is finished. I hope you can all join me in our next episode as we install the rough plumbing.